So I'm very excited to announce our first speakers for 2022, Chris and Melissa Bruntlett, who will present on Moving Forward Together, Advancing Safe, Inclusive and Resilient Streets. Go ahead. Perfect. All right. So, well, first off, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers from MT MTF for inviting us to come and share with you for what is our morning and your evening. Uh, it's our pleasure to be uh, sharing some of our experiences and our work that we've been uh, working on for the last, well, we've been working in advocacy now for almost 10 years uh, in terms of cycling and active transportation. So to be able to hopefully help provide you all with a little more context and some examples of uh, cities that are creating more safe, inclusive and resilient spaces uh, to help bring those to your communities. We've been warned we move quite quickly, so please uh, strap in and uh, get ready to go. <laughs> so a little more about uh, our, ourselves. So um, for my part, when we moved here in uh, 2019, I started working for an, a consultancy called Mobicon, uh, which is a Dutch North American firm, uh, where my role is working with the international markets to export the best practice around Dutch cycling and um, just mobility in general to cities across North America and throughout Europe, uh, working with um, a small and larger, well, small, medium and large size cities and uh, helping to communicate a lot of the work that has been done here in context for the local cities. And myself for the past three years, I've served as the marketing and communication manager for the Dutch Cycling Embassy, which is a, an NGO, a, a nonprofit that was created by the national government here in the Netherlands, specifically to export the knowledge and expertise that exists in this country in the field of cycling. So we have about 85 public and private organizations, municipal governments, uh, public transport agencies, universities, and, and private consultants such as Mobicon. Uh, and we're able to put together these complementary teams of Dutch experts and work with cities around the world on their own specific challenges and opportunities. So uh, yeah, the, the first thing we always hear when we start talking about the Netherlands is, uh, yeah, but that, they're different, their culture is different, their, their built environment is different, their context is different. And that's certainly true in, in some very specific ways, but I think people would be generally surprised at how similar uh, the Netherlands is to other places in the world. And, and we don't look at Amsterdam or Utrecht or Delft in isolation, but try to encourage people to look at the larger Randstad metropolitan area, which is this uh, circular shaped uh, metropolis of 23 municipalities, uh, the largest port, uh, sorry, the second largest port in the world uh, in Rotterdam, uh, the third largest airport in Europe at uh, Amsterdam Schiphol, uh, and eight and a half million people. So it's I think it's easy to dismiss Amsterdam as a city of 600,000 as being irrelevant, but when you look at the larger uh, context, you see that it's not that dissimilar from uh, a, a London, a Los Angeles, or even uh, yeah, a metropolitan Melbourne area. And there's obviously some differences in terms of the density, but I think as Melbourne starts building up instead of building outward, uh, they will have more in common than, uh, than we would initially think. Obviously, the key difference being the way that people move around. And, and as we get into in this presentation, for the past 50 years, the Dutch have been creating a more balanced and diversified uh, mobility network where about a third of all trips are made walking and cycling in, in most cities. A third are made by car, a third are made by public transport versus, uh, of course, Melbourne, where uh, the vast majority of, of uh, journeys are made in the automobile and, and usually single occupant automobile. So we, we get into, you know, sort of why that is. And I think most of you are probably familiar with uh, Dutch cities being very, very bike friendly. The map on the right hand side, all of that white area is part of the cycling network here in the Netherlands. So you can see compared to the rest of Europe, it is very dense. Um, there's over Oh, 37, yeah, thank you. 37,000 kilometers of uh, bike network, but and that's a, um, a combination of separated cycling facilities, traffic calm streets uh, with speeds of 30 kilometers an hour or less, um, intercity connections and, and rural networks. So basically, at any point, wherever you are in the Netherlands, there's usually an, a cycle track that'll get you where you need to get to uh, safely and comfortably. But it's also complemented by this nationwide rail network, which is the map you see on the left hand side and we thought was really important for Melbourne in terms of thinking about how it's not just about cycling, but how cycling connects with public transport. 
And we often talk about uh, the connectivity of this nation in terms of not an inter intercity rail network, but almost like a metro system for the entire country that runs rapidly and frequently at pretty much all hours of the day, obviously getting slower as you get into the evening. Um, but it's an important part of this uh, moving towards a sustainable system in that the bike train combination, which we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit more about later, becomes an integral part of the transportation network and providing people with more options beyond just the car. But as we often stress, this these rail and cycle networks didn't come with the country. Uh, they weren't predestined to, to be there. They weren't always there. there. They were specifically built uh, in response to uh, an inflection point in the 1970s that their society experienced. Uh, after 20 years after the Second World War of building their cities around the car, they hit a bit of a roadblock insofar as the traffic safety crisis that was killing 3,000 residents uh, each year, plus uh, including 400 children. Uh, so there were protest movements of families and, and cyclists and environmentalists and historical preservations that took to the streets to protest against the rise of the automobile in their city. And that uh, paralleled uh, with the uh, OPEC oil crisis of 1973, when for six weeks, the price of gasoline skyrocketed, the sale of bicycles doubled, the streets were stripped of cars and, and both, uh, well, the public saw their, uh, how much of their city they'd given away to cars. They were suddenly able to uh, have picnics on the motorways and, and ride their bicycles everywhere. Uh, and the politicians decided, discovered that uh, a single mode uh, transport system is very fragile and, and susceptible to outside shocks. So they set upon this very different path to build, yeah, not just a, a cycling country, but a, a walking, cycling, uh, public transportation. And uh, of course, not doing away with the car altogether, but using it where it is uh, appropriate. And so that period was followed by uh, a series of experiments, uh, essentially. So it's it's been a, a learning process in the Netherlands that we often harken back and harken back to the lessons that we can learn. And it wasn't smooth sailing; it wasn't a immediate adoption of cycling. And so you saw test uh, pro projects, uh, specifically in the city of The Hague and also in uh, Tilburg and the south east west of the city east, east of the city <laughs> apologies i get turned around because my ocean is on a different side now <laughs> um anyways uh where they put in demonstration projects uh from the city level building a cycle one cycle track to sort of test out separation or changing the street network a little bit to make more room for cycling uh, and what they were met with was very similar to what a lot of cities today are met with in terms of pushback from the business community from residents newspapers were publishing terrible articles, death threats were sent to politicians, uh, basically saying that this was not the way of the future. And you even have, as you see in the top right, uh, the demonstration project in The Hague where business owners hired contractors to come and rip out the cycle track from the street and remove the paving stones. So it was not met without controversy in terms of these uh, steps forward and in, in moving towards more, more sustainable mobility options. Um, but the, the nice thing is that through experimentation became uh, the plans that Chris will talk about now. Yeah, so we'll, we'll touch on, I think, five or six key principles that came out of that trial and error period, because I think for the first 25 years, as we said, the, the Dutch tried things and a lot didn't work and some things did work and they built together this uh, this blueprint, if you will, this book of best practices that we now uh, export, help other cities export and, and adapt to their own uh, context. And I think the first thing we always stress is that every mobility plan needs a car plan. It's not enough to provide just alternatives, uh, even as uh, attractive alternatives. You do have to make driving a little bit indirect, a little bit inconvenient and, and nudge people in the right direction. And what Dutch cities have done really well is create a hierarchy of streets, uh, distributor roads and local access roads where the uh, through traffic is uh, pushed to the perimeter of the city away from the sensitive residential and commercial areas. Uh, and they tack a couple of extra kilometers onto the car journeys, which makes walking and cycling the most direct uh, and convenient way to move around their cities. Um, and uh, also frees up space on those streets for people to walk, cycle, the children to play, um, ultimately resulting in a much more livable city. And then a lot of the inner cities, they have what they call low car areas where it's restricted only to residents, uh, service vehicles and freight vehicles. 
uh, and all through traffic it has to park on the outskirts of the city uh, and enter by foot or uh, bicycle. So when you get out of that city center or just in general when you're looking at the, the overall network, one of the, the key things that we emphasize and, and we found I don't know what I've done. <laughs> the Dutch has been um, that you're designing for the behavior that you want. So it's not a, not so much as to put up a sign and say, this is the speed you need to travel on. This is a, a space where you need to share space with bicycles. It's about changing the actual topography of the street to change the psychology of how um, users are behave in that space. So that's through traffic calming elements like speed tables where you raise the road uh, to change the elevation thus indicating you need to behave a little bit differently in the space, using chicanes, uh, narrowing of streets, and this all helps to change uh, the way people perceive they need to operate in a, in a space. So wide roads obviously encourage us to, or maybe not obviously, but do encourage us to travel a little bit faster. Narrowing the space causes us to slow down and be aware that we are now in a new space where we need to be aware of who, uh, who else is around us and, and behave accordingly. So I think the, the biggest thing that came out of those two um, experimentations in Tilburg and The Hague was uh, the Dutch just realized very quickly that it's not enough to build individual routes uh, that don't connect anywhere to anywhere. They have to look at the city in a more uh, holistic level, uh, at a, a, a network level, if you will. Uh, and that uh, it happened first in, in our hometown in Delft in, in the early 1980s where they came up with, instead of just one or two routes, um, looked at the existing routes in the city, looked at the, uh, the missing gaps in the network, and uh, in talking to residents, in mapping where people were traveling throughout the city, came up with this concept, not of a single cycle network, but actually three uh, grids uh, of varying sizes designed for various distances and users. So the red grid uh, has a spacing of about a kilometer. It's for longer distance trips, perhaps to the office. Uh, the blue grid has a, a smaller uh, spacing and uh, maybe designed to go to the shops or restaurants or, or friends' houses. And then the really fine grain green grid is for those really shorter trips to school, to the corner store, uh, and so on. And so they're designing not just for the, the trip to work, but all those other trips we make throughout the day to the train station, to the, the coffee shop, to friends' houses, to the swimming pool, et cetera. Uh, and as a result, you can cycle uh, anywhere to everywhere in, in most cities in the Netherlands after they established these, these principles uh, in, in Delft in the 1980s. But importantly within that network is making sure to pay attention to the weakest link or the intersection, intersections and junctions. Uh, oftentimes when uh, planning is done for uh, walking and cycling, the intersection is deemed very difficult, the most challenging and is often overlooked. Uh, but one of the key elements in terms of Dutch planning has been to make sure that that is a very well attended to point in terms of the network design and the planning. And so, of course, you have the very big infrastructure like roundabouts and protected intersections where the flow of walking and cycling is prioritized over driving. Various elements in terms of the design force drivers to intersect with vulnerable road users almost at a perpendicular uh, access, making sure that they can see around them, they're, they're forced to pay attention, uh, and there's a lot of forgiving uh, elements built in and designed into the intersections and roundabouts. But another key detail, which you can see on the right, is the intersections with access roads and essentially forcing cars in most cases to enter into and move up into the pedestrian and cycling realm. So what you can see there is a continuous bikeway and footpath. So pedestrians and cyclists are not moving down into the road space and then coming back up into pedestrian space, but rather their movement is prioritized over cars, which again hints into that traffic psychology because cars are forced to recognize I'm in a new space. I'm now in a space that I don't belong in. I need to pay attention to what's happening around me and then carry on onto the next road. And that's a really important design element uh, that has allowed for vulnerable road users to feel that they are the priority in the road space. Another very important uh, element here, and, and this was, again was a fairly recent development in the past 20 years, is the synergy between cycling and public transport. Um, Dutch planners spotted all these piles of bikes at, at train stations and, and bus stops and realized perhaps they were onto something. 
And, and the fact of the matter is that by allowing cycling to uh, your public transport system, you're actually widening the catchment areas of your stops and stations by about five fold uh, because people can walk, will comfortably walk about a kilometer. They can cycle five times that distance uh, with the same time and effort. So by providing secure bike parking at these facilities, free bike parking at these facilities, not allowing the bikes on the, the public transport system itself because that affects the reliability of the system, the capacity of the system and the scalability of the overall network. Uh, and then a last mile solution on the other end of their journey. This is the blue and yellow bike in the top left, bottom left corner with a tap of the same public transport card. You have the same door to door convenience of the private automobile, but with, uh, with a, a non-car means. And uh, this is now uh, a very important model here in the Netherlands, 650,000 people approximately each day use the bike train combination uh, to get where they're going. And it, it provides that longer distance alternative to the car for journeys of 50, 60, 100 kilometers across the, the uh, metropolitan area. And one final element uh, that we'll talk about in terms of sort of the Dutch planning has been the explosion of electromobility or specifically e-bikes. Um, of varying uh, powers that have become quite prevalent on Dutch streets and intercity connections, and most notably used by the aging population as it allows them to extend their mobility longer into old age and be able to participate longer. And we think this is particularly interesting for, you know, Melbourne or cities of Australian context where you have your hot summers, <laughs> uh, perhaps some topography to deal with, and electro, elect electric bikes um, help to remove the sweat from the equ equation. So you see people using them quite prevalently in the summer here, but also help to flatten hills. And so, uh, you know, for aging population, I, we recognize that the Netherlands can be quite flat, but bridges can be a bit of a challenge for even the most able-bodied. And, you know, as those hills get bigger in other places, the electric bike really helps to provide that mobility option uh, for people of varying abilities, ages, uh, and backgrounds. And, you know, we see the uh, potential growing elsewhere in the world and the Dutch leading the way in terms of uh, having the highest bike sales in all of Europe, e-bike sales of all in all of Europe. Per capita. Per capita. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, as, as I said earlier, we, we run into this, this excuse uh, fairly frequently. That would never work here. Our city's different. Um, and uh, we have to remind a lot of people how recent this transformation was in the Netherlands, uh, and and uh, because it, it can be often deflating when you see how far ahead they are uh, now in the in the twenty twenties. Uh, but this is a, a great example we use of the main market square in Delft, where we currently live, the living room of the city, which was a surface parking lot until uh, two thousand and four. So only sixteen years ago was it filled with cars. Uh, and through a pilot project that, that made the, the inner city auto loo or, or low car, uh, they were able to get those parked cars out of the city center. And it is now quite a vibrant place for shopping, dining and, uh, and meeting. So uh, it's never too late to get started. And, and we're gonna go through some examples of cities outside the Netherlands that have, have applied these Dutch principles and uh, uh, started their own journeys to becoming uh, more quote unquote Dutch. So of course we always start with our former hometown of the city of Vancouver in Canada. And we moved there just at the beginning of what would become a 10 year process in terms of building out their cycling network. Uh, and what makes Vancouver story so special is it was one of those places where a young uh, progressive mayor put his name forward and, and made a promise that if he was elected, he would put investment and time into building a, a robust cycling network for all ages and abilities. And upon being elected in 2008, set, about, set upon doing that, uh, taking one project at a time to really provide more options for people of, as I said, all ages and abilities. And of course he was met with similar controversy to what politicians and planners were met with here in the Netherlands in the seventies, where newspapers were publishing articles saying this would be the end of his career or in the early, early days of his uh, mayoralship. Um, and business communities were saying that his plans were going to choke the lifeblood out of the city center. And we're very happy to always report that over the course of the 10 years, every new project built upon the other to really build out not just the network, but the adopting of said network by families like our own and people with varying backgrounds and abilities to make cycling a part of 
how they traveled through the city. Uh, Mayor Gregor Robertson was elected three times uh, and only st uh, stopped being mayor when he stepped down. Um, so it was proof that by making those promises and by sticking to his plan uh, and by not being afraid of the controversy, he was able to really make change in, uh, in the city that will always be a strong part of our past and, and how we came to be here today. Perhaps more inspiring uh, even uh, than Vancouver is uh, a city just across the just across the Rocky Mountains, about a thousand kilometers east uh, of Vancouver in Calgary, Alberta, in the middle of the Canadian prairies, uh, a, a, a frigid winter city where the temperature regularly drops into the minus 20s. Uh, they themselves saw what Vancouver was doing and thought, well, maybe we can accelerate the timeline a little bit. So they came up with a plan uh, to build a, uh, a pilot project of cycle tracks, not just one cycle track, but a minimum grid of cycle tracks in the city center uh, as a test, uh, an experiment, if you will, uh, to show what's possible to the general public. It was put in virtually overnight for a period of 18 months. Uh, it was measured quite closely to see its impact on traffic and, and uh, user or ridership. Uh, it was used very, uh, they used very light, quick, cheap materials. So it was adjusted and adapted in response to some uh, pinch points or, or problem areas. And then after the 18 months, they, they took the experiment to the city council and said, do you wanna keep this or should we rip it out? So there was little to no risk of failure here. It was just uh, um, a way of getting it done with, uh, without it feeling permanent, like the city was burdened with these cycle tracks. And we're pleased to report there were 1.3 million new cycle trips induced over that 18 month period. And uh, it only required Five million Canadian dollars, which is a drop in the bucket when you come to when you talk about building car infrastructure, and it only required two percent of the downtown road network reallocated to start moving new people, create a brand new mode of transport in the city of Calgary, which people use not just in the summer months, but we've been there in January, and uh, and people do gear up in their snow gear and their goggles and masks and 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 get out on their bikes. So it's proof that uh, yeah, if you have the political will, if you have the right strategy, that you can uh, build out these principles uh, even in uh, cold winter cities. Now moving south, <laughs> another good example of a city that is taking Dutch principles uh, to heart and building out their network is the city of Austin, Texas. So in the early 2010s, they brought over the Dutch cycling embassy uh, to meet with their planners to say, okay, we want to build out a cycling network. We want to change some journeys from cars to bikes. How do we do that? And through a process with the city, with the Dutch cycling embassy, with experts from the Netherlands, they developed a network that focused on short journeys. So journeys under five kilometers um, and how to cha uh, change those trips because they were deemed as the easiest to make the shift. So instead of focusing on how do we build out a commuting network, how do we build out a neighborhood network? Uh, and so in um, identifying key areas within the network, identifying places where people are coming from and going to within that uh, radius, they have since built out a protected, well, as you see here, <laughs> protected bike lane network that really helps to induce new trips. They're constantly building on it, uh, allowing people to get to shops easily, getting to school and community centers. Uh, and this whole network was focused around really bringing the community together and, and really starting, trying to transition those trips uh, that we often take for granted uh, to make it easier for walking and cy cycling, more safe, more comfortable, and more accessible for all ages. Yeah, so this process was started in 2012, and they are on track to have completed 650 kilometers of bikeways by 2025, which is quite remarkable, and uh, and uh, we're, we're quite uh, happy to shine a light on Austin because it's a story that not a lot of people do know about. So that brings us to our, our current situation, the corona crisis. I don't think any of us could have anticipated uh, its arrival or its impact on our streets and our mobility patterns, but um, we watched as, as cities um, were stripped of their cars virtually overnight, like, like most people, uh, and then some really interesting interventions and, uh, and uh, um, policies that were implemented in response to this crisis that reminded us a little bit of, uh, of the, the Netherlands' own uh, oil crisis in the 1970s. So we're going to talk a little bit about 
uh, at the global response to COVID-19 and, and what that may mean for the future. So at the beginning of the pandemic, as everyone was locked down or, you know, staying indoors or uh, staying in place, what, one of the first things we saw was the development of slow streets uh, here in Europe, in North America, and even in places in Australia and New Zealand, where uh, neighborhood streets were trans transformed from places for through traffic to places to get outside and get physical activity, uh, recognizing in a lot of places that um, staying in home obviously has detrimental effects on not only your physical health, but also your mental health. And so these neighborhood streets were opened up to allow families places to go for walks, to cycle, to really slow down traffic in their communities. Uh, and were shown to be a great way to get people active at a time when we all needed to be physically distanced from each other. So as cities started coming out of lockdown, they were presented with a very real problem. Uh, and that was the loss of capacity and attractiveness of their public transportation systems with social distancing requirements uh, and with people no longer wanting to rub shoulders with strangers on buses, trams and trains. Um, there was a real fear that many of those people for essential journeys would jump in their cars on top of existing traffic. That would be quite disastrous to uh, the congestion problems, the air and noise pollution problems, uh, the movement of freight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in London's uh, perhaps the most uh, potent example of this, uh, they estimated that uh, when cities first started coming out of lockdown, they were only able to operate at one fifth capacity. So that's 8 million journeys a day that were lost uh, through their public transportation system that potentially had to be made up by other means of travel. And they estimated that would require a tenfold increase in miles cycled and a fivefold increase in miles walked. And that was uh, actually quantified quite well by the national government in Italy who hired uh, a Dutch firm, Decisio, uh, to actually put some some numbers on that dilemma. And they looked at uh, three different scenarios coming out of lockdown. The first scenario was to do nothing and let everybody hop in their cars uh, on top of existing traffic and calculate the cost of society that that would uh, ultimately entail. And then they looked at two scenarios of degrees of intervention, creating new space for walking and cycling, creating new walking and cycling infrastructure uh, that would attempt to create a shift to walking and e-cycling, incentivizing its use, providing subsidies to uh, maintain and, and purchase an e-bike, for example. Uh, and as you can see there, the, the cost savings to society were in the billions of euros. So this, this study became the foundation for a lot of it, cities in Italy uh, to start building out temporary networks of, of walking and cycling infrastructure and create these subsidies and incentives for people not to take their car uh, after the, the, the virus hit. At the same time, we saw a lot of cities building out pop-up cycling networks. So um, in Italy, that was happening, but also in France, in Berlin, um, and countless other cities throughout the world, where they recognized that one of the ways they were going to ensure that essential workers could still get to work, uh, those people who had to get to the office could get there safely and physically distanced, um, by providing new networks. So the case in Berlin, we actually, with Mobicon, helped to uh, develop a bit of a guide, was simply looking at the road network, um, looking at where they could transition some traffic lanes to pop-up bike, bike lanes, um, putting down just a bit of tape and some flex posts and allowing people that space uh, to cycle safely. And what we saw is, you know, 26 2,600 kilometers and 1.7 billion euros of investment into cycling measures throughout Europe. Uh, we saw a lot of these networks really kick up the number of people that were cycling and cycling experiencing a bit of a boom um, because of the space that was handed over and showing uh, through these demonstration projects that with a little bit of rethinking how the road space is used, they could actually start to test out uh, some of these ideas that could potentially be made permanent in the future in post-lockdown. So the third thing we saw, which was, I think, fairly uncontroversial because uh, everybody likes to <laughs> go to the restaurant, was the uh, this massive reclamation of space from uh, car parking and car movement to outdoor dining districts, whether it was surface parking lots, streets, or on-street parking spaces. Uh, in Rotterdam alone, they converted over a thousand on-street parking spaces uh, for the use of businesses, for uh, dining, restaurants, ice cream shops, uh, hairdressers, 
Uh, and it was all done without the use of, of permits. It was basically this, this free for all. If you wanted to, to reclaim a parking space, you just had to, to build it and follow a basic set of guidelines. So we saw uh, vast amounts of space uh, reclaimed from the car in a very short period of time uh, for the sake of, of business. Uh, the irony, of course, being a lot of these businesses thought that they required uh, the movement and storage of cars outside their front door to, to maintain their commerce levels. And finally, looking forward, uh, we actually look to your continent. <laughs> uh, the city of Sydney is one that uh, took this uh, rather large tragedy that we're all sort of still living through and took it as an opportunity to expedite a plan that they had already in place to build out their network over the course of a number of decades into condensing it into a number of years. Uh, the idea being that now we have this opportunity to encourage more cycling trips to really uh, kickstart what we've already what we've got planned and help to transition those trips much sooner. And so um, the green recovery, if you will, has been uh, really the idea of taking taking the momentum and building out that space and creating more space for cycling uh, in order to move things forward and make sure that in the next um, pandemic or in the next uh, environmental catastrophe, there are uh, resilient options for transport so that our networks and our economy can keep moving forward and our people can keep moving safely. Yeah, so uh, in our, our most recent book, we, we spent a chapter exploring the, the concept of resilience. And, and uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the traditional sense uh, definition of resilience, this idea of engineering resilience, which is simply the ability of a system to return to its original state after an outside shock or disturbance. And uh, through our research, we were introduced to this idea of ecological resilience, which is uh, actually um, uh, the ability of a system not to return to its original state uh, after that disturbance, but to flip and, and find a new normal, a new uh, uh, balance uh, uh, in response to that uh, outside disturbance when it realizes that it's no longer a, a sustainable uh, normal, if you will. So that really got us thinking about the parallels between the, uh, the, the Netherlands' own history and their uh, flip to a new normal in the 1970s. And, and, and uh, Milan is the example we show here. Uh, which just announced 750 kilometer net cycle network that it will start building out this year. Um, there is a new normal that we can establish uh, because the status quo, the, the old normal uh, was doing uh, yeah, a great deal of, of damage and we're hopeful that this means uh, permanent change to our cities in the years and decades ahead. So it's important now that we've gone through all of the what that is happening uh, to understand why. And that's what we focus on in, in the second book in Curbing Traffic is understanding why these policies are so important to us as humanity. And the first obvious, obvious category we started with was the effect that has on our children. Uh, so we talked about this in our presentations in the past, how the Dutch have been repeatedly noted, or Dutch children anyways, noted as the, some of the happiest kids in the world. And it's not because their parents are better. Uh, and it's not because uh, Dutch children are somehow superior, but it's because of the freedom that's been built into their childhood here. So from a very young age, most Dutch children ride with their, ch with their parents side by side. And usually around the age of eight or nine, they start making trips to school, to, to their friends' houses, to community centers, to sports on their own. Not because they're braver, but because the network has been built out as such that it allows them the freedom to move around their cities without worrying about uh, conflicts with cars and without their parents worrying about whether or not they'll be put in a stressful and dangerous situation. And this is really important when we're thinking about the development of our children in terms of not just their independence, but their ability to establish risk, to understand what they're capable of and to build on that and to grow into healthy uh, and stable adults. Another uh, demographic group that, uh, that we've seen really firsthand benefit from uh, the, the mobility networks here in the Netherlands have been people with physical disabilities. And I think this is a bit of a, a myth uh, that, that is often pushed out when you start talking about providing alternatives to the car is that everybody with a disability wants to drive or needs to drive. Uh, and through our research, through the statistics we buried, through the people that we've spoke to, uh, we, we've quickly discovered uh, that they, many people with disabilities don't have either the physical means or the economic means 
uh, to own and operate a, a private automobile. And we've seen how the networks of cycling infrastructure, the traffic calm streets provide a lot of people with the uh, same autonomy and freedom of the children uh, to get about their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's on an adapted bicycle, a tricycle, uh, an electric hand cycle, uh, a scoop mobile, which is kind of the three wheel device you see in the top right corner. Um, it, it really is an improvement to a lot of people's quality of life when we're talking about providing alternatives to the car, not replacements for the car, because again, those that, that want to drive and need to drive uh, also fare quite well here in the Netherlands. The other thing that I've come to recognize having moved here and one of the really important things about uh, building out a network and the network that gets you to not just to work but all the places in between is the impact that has on women in their mobility. Um, the networks that recognize that it's that you're not just traveling from home to work every day but are making significant care trips be that taking kids to school, uh, running errands, doing groceries, taking care of elderly family the networks that provide an alternative transport option to just the, the car really uh, become more equitable in terms of how genders move through their cities. And it recognizes that um, we take a whole slew of trips in the day. And when we make it easy to go from one point to a go from home to the store, to school, to work, then to pick up groceries and come back and do a whole bunch of spider webbed loops, if you will, that it makes a network function much better for women. Uh, it makes it much easier for them to choose a different option. And it really is emancipating and empowering for women. And last but not least, uh, we spend the final chapter of, of Curb and Traffic um, exploring what it means to uh, create an age-friendly city. And again, I think there's this, this pernicious myth that uh, the elderly are reliant on cars uh, and uh, it often uh, forgets the fact that there is a period in our lives where we're no longer able to drive. The, uh, the research shows about 10 years, we outlive our ability to drive safely by about an average of 10 years. And that means for a lot of people, uh, a, a complete loss of freedom and autonomy, uh, a reliance on public transport, on uh, elderly children to give drives around the city or, or to be housebound or institutionalized. Uh, and another thing we've seen here is, again, the way the mobility networks allow people here in Dutch cities to age in place comfortably, to grow up on the streets where they were born almost uh, in some cases, uh, and to still participate in society without feeling like they have lost their wings, if you will, uh, when their driver's license is eventually taken away. So we always end with this existential question. <laughs> what kind of future is it that we want? Uh, and on the left-hand side is a very real ad we saw early on in the pandemic um, of a idea from Peloton of, you know, get your, get your bike ride in on the way to work in your autonomous vehicle, which seems so counterintuitive to what we're doing, or create a network where the scene on the right-hand side can be much more common, where you can see people of all ages, all backgrounds, all abilities, uh, moving around their city in sustainable and active ways and in social ways that make them connected to not just the city that they live in, but the people who live around them. And we often say that, of course, what we all want is what's on the right. Um, and what's important now is that we start working towards making more and more cities have that quality of life for their citizens. So that was it. We did it. Uh, 38 minutes. So we went a little bit over. Apologies for that. Um, that was basically three presentations in one, uh, but hopefully, yeah, you, you enjoyed uh, the content. Hopefully you were inspired. Um, hopefully we didn't move too quickly. And, and if you are interested in reading more, uh, our two books are available virtually anywhere you buy your books, uh, Building Traffic, uh, Building Traffic, Building the Cycling City, <laughs> The Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality and Curbing Traffic, The Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives. We're happy to answer questions, but if you don't uh, get your question answered or you wanna talk about perhaps uh, working together in the, in the future, uh, feel free to get in touch by email or through our website. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris, Melissa, uh, a, a wonderful presentation. And my imagined future is much like yours. I think the two slides you have with the, the people walking and holding hands and cycling and holding hands, uh, presents a really positive view of the future. Thank you so much for getting up and, and, um, caffeinating and presenting such a, a comprehensive as you said, a three-way presentation, it's been squashed into one. We're, we're, we're deeply grateful for the time that you've um, made for us. And I wonder if you might 
take a few questions.